Good evening. I am Sophia Avery, a Christian therapist and owner of Christian Talk Therapy. And Amber has asked me to talk a little bit about grief and grieving and helping those who are grieving. So I appreciate Amber. I'm praying for you, Amber. I know what it's like to lose a mom and and I know the journey. So blessings on you and I'll be praying for you. So this has been one heck of a year. 2020 has brought us all types of good things, some, and a lot of horrible, bad things, and a lot of grief. A lot of us have experienced personal losses, such as Amber and me, actually, this year, and a lot of you. And we either are grieving or we know someone who is grieving. As a result, we have to understand what to do with all of this grief. Even as a nation, we need to understand that. So why do we grieve? That's a good question. Why is grieving important? Let's delve into that. So why do we grieve? Why is grieving important? Grieving, to put it simply, is a result of loving. We grieve because we loved. And it's a natural way to respond to the loss of a person who we love. Of course, we don't lose the love we have for them. We'll always have that, but we actually do lose the ability to express that love in person or in the natural. We can definitely still express it in the spiritual, but that's a part of what the grieving process involves. So we experience emotional pain and sadness because we are suddenly put in a position to live without someone who was precious to us. We have to redefine our relationships with them and redefine ourselves in a lot of ways and redefine our world. So, you know, for example, Amber was a caretaker of her mother for 10 years, as was I. So she will no longer be a caretaker. She'll always be her mother's daughter, but she will no longer be a caretaker. And that can be a big shift. That can be a big shift and adjusting to that new reality can take some time. No longer being able to be there and care for her mom can take take a toll. So that's a part of the grieving process. We also never imagined having to live without our loved one. Even though, you know, we all know that we, you know, the life process involves being born, living, and then dying. We never really imagined what that is like or what that would be like. So uh, we grieve because we're in this new reality that we never imagined and it's not a happy place. So how is grief expressed? Most often we express grief through crying. Like we started with the, the beginning, Jesus wept. We expressed grief, we, we express grief through crying and through sadness. And this one might fool you, might you may not have been aware of this, but we express it oftentimes through anger. Anger is a very common way a lot of people don't express emotions like sadness or crying or anything heavy except anger. So everything comes out as anger, everything. So that's the go-to emotion for a lot of people. We can also see it expressed through, through some other ways, and that might be hyperactivity, irritability, impatience, uh, withdrawing, isolating, and numbness like flatlining where you don't feel anything, highs or lows, that can be as a result of unexpressed grief. Physical pain. If your neck hurts, you got tightness in your shoulders, your back hurts, if you have stomach problems, if you have knee joint issues, um, a lot of times that's as a result of unexpressed emotional pain and grief. We also have addictive behaviors, and unfortunately for some people, they do turn to substances to relieve the pain, the emotional pain of grieving. And that can, not only are the addictive behaviors to do with substances, it can also include shopping, working, exercising, eating, definitely, 
in a lot of other unhealthy ways that we uh, go to when we can't adequately express our grief or when our grieving process is cut short. So let's look a little bit deeper at crying. Crying is a way of expressing emotions that cannot be spoken at that time. For many of pe many people who are grieving can barely think straight, much less express what particular emotions they're feeling at that moment. So it comes out in tears and that's okay. You know, a lot of people are uncomfortable with shedding tears a lot of people are uncomfortable being around people who are crying or shedding tears or weeping like Jesus did. But I think we have to take a cue from Jesus in that it's okay to cry. It's just a way of expressing an emotion or a number of emotions. It doesn't say anything about you as a person. It doesn't say anything about whether you're strong or weak. It's just a physical response to emotional pain, period, point blank, period. If Jesus wept, then who are we not to to weep? Who are we to think that we're stronger than Jesus? But that's a cultural thing. It's cultural. And I don't know where it comes from. But our cultural beliefs are that men who cry or men shouldn't cry and women who cry are weak. Men who cry are weak. But that's a lie from hell because Jesus wept. So in essence, what the enemy wants you to think is that Jesus was weak because he wept and so you are also weak if you weep or if you cry but that's not true crying is only an expression of emotional pain so if you're uncomfortable being around people who cry it may be because you are having some issues maybe you have some unexpressed grief some unexpressed emotions that are painful that need to be worked through because maybe their discomfort brings up your discomfort. So we wanna take a look at that if you are inclined, but of course, if Jesus wept, it's okay for us to weep. Okay, so now that we know it's okay to cry, what do we do if we're grieving? If you find yourself crying a lot or sad or you have identified any of the other uh, behaviors that we associate with grieving, what do you do? The first thing is to process your emotions. And in processing your emotions, we have to be able to identify them. And you can obtain a list of feeling words to help you increase your emotional vocabulary. You can get feeling words online, just Google feeling words. So we want to identify how we feel first and then process those emotions by I suggest writing. Writing helps you move your thoughts and your emotions out of your head and your heart and your spirit into another place. And that could be a notebook or a journal or anything, any other type of uh, paper or a computer where you can record your thoughts. Some people process emotions by writing prayers, poems, writing songs or just writing their thoughts. You know, so writing definitely helps, even if it's just writing a couple of sentences that can even help you unpack your emotions. The next thing is to talk, Pan. So I definitely think talking is important, but be sure to uh, seek professional help, unless you have a friend that's a therapist or somebody who is trained in how to listen Oftentimes, our family and friends just want us to feel better, but we need somebody to listen and help us process our emotions when we're grieving. Another thing is to identify and inform your dream team. And uh, your dream team is your idea of who your supported friends and family are. If you contact them, if you're able to contact them before you have some type of loss and tell them what you need, it would help a lot when you're actually going through the grieving process. And this can be difficult at times because, you know, if you lose someone suddenly, you may not be able to identify what you need. But if you and your friends and family could have conversations about what we do 
what we need, what we need to do, and how we can process our emotions. If something happens, it will go a long way to help the healing process. The last thing I suggest to do if we're grieving is to create rituals. Rituals are actions you can do to help you memorialize your loved ones. And that can involve cooking their favorite foods and inviting people over to share and, um, you know, tell them how close you were to that person and how you, they love these particular foods. Or even just the process of cooking them and eating them yourself can be therapeutic. Another thing you can do is sing their favorite songs and watch movies that they loved. You know, one of my cousins lost her mom and her mother's favorite movie was a Temptations movie. So she would often watch it as a way of feeling close to her mom. You can wear a piece of jewelry or clothing or perfume that reminds you of them. You could also create a memories book and keep adding to it. You know, uh, you can put whatever you have in it to start it. But as you go through your life, you may hear stories about your loved one who has passed. Or you may see something that you think they might have liked or that they had. And you can make copies of it and, and keep adding to that book regularly as a way of processing your own emotions and uh, healing. The last thing I have, I have identified is to think of fun things you did together and do them again with your friends and family. If you enjoy going to the zoo together, then plan a trip to the zoo and ask your friends to go or a family member. And that's another way of helping you to process your emotions and, and actively making sure that you're grieving and getting the process of healing uh, continuing to move forward. The last thing we need to keep in mind if you are grieving is that you definitely want to be mindful of taking care of yourself. If you're doing things to help you process your emotions and nothing seems to help, it may be important for you to seek professional help. Be careful with grief because it can turn into depression. It's situational depression that is has to do with the loss of the loved one but it still is considered depression. So definitely if it's more than six months after the loss of your loved one and you still are feeling sad or you, you know, have times when you can't get out of bed or, <clears throat> or feeling unlike yourself, please, please seek counseling. Find a therapist to help you start working through your emotions. Don't neglect your emotional health because it definitely can affect your physical health. And right now we need our immune systems to be 100%. So please take care of yourself and don't allow your, your grief to turn into depression. So our last topic is how do we help? How to help someone who is grieving? The first thing that we usually ask when we encounter someone who has lost a loved one is saying, what can I do? And you sincerely want to know, what can I do? What can I do? But unfortunately, they don't know what you can do because they can barely think about what they need to do. They have no idea what you can do. So what we have to do when we're helping someone or want to help somebody who's lost a loved one is ask ourselves, what do they need? What do they need? That's the question that we have to ask. First, the way to find out what they need is to listen to them. Listen to them and pay attention to cues about what they need. You may hear them mention something it's like, oh, wow, I need to go to the, to the hospital and get some records, or I need to go online and post the funeral arrangements, or I need to you know, put up a Facebook page and invite people to join and share memories. That's the things that they say. Sometimes you can hear, oh, I can do that. Oh, I can do that for you. I'll do that for you. That's how we start helping people who are in the process of grieving. The other way is to anticipate their needs. You know, 
they eat, you know, they need to eat. You are hungry, so they're probably hungry. So buy them food or cook them food or order food. Send a pizza. You know, they need to eat. We know that. Anticipate their needs. What else do they need? They might enjoy having their house clean. Well, who wouldn't enjoy having their house clean, tell you the truth. But if you're over there, you might see that the dishes need to be washed. Or you might need see there's some, some dust on the floor. Or you might see that the plants need to be watered. Just do it. Don't ask them, do you want me to water your plants? Don't ask. Just do it. Just do it. If you know they like to, to have their bed made, go in the bedroom. Be sure you change the sheets if necessary or fluff the pillows. Be sure that their sleeping environment is comfortable so that they can rest. You know, we have to anticipate their needs. Another thing we can do is sit with them. Sit with them in silence. We call it being fully present. And I know it's not easy to do because as a therapist, I had to train in how to sit with people in silence without distracting myself. So that means sitting with them, being fully present and not occupying yourself by looking at your phone or calling somebody or texting, but just being fully present, sitting with them in silence and not trying to fill the silence by talking. It's not easy to do. And everybody can't do it. And it might be that you can't do it. So if that's not your thing, go on in there and make some food or something. Make them a cup of tea, like Sheldon did on the Big Bang Theory. Make them a cup of tea. Another thing you can do is spend time with them. Having friends around ensures that they don't feel alone. So that's something else you can do. You can go go tell them you want to come pick them up and take them down Kelly Drive, go for a walk. Or you're going to go bring them some soup and sit with them while they eat soup and watch a movie or watch Netflix. This is the perfect time for Netflix and chill with your friends and family. But they need to have some people who are willing to just come sit with them. And this is not just for this month. You know, the grieving process can take months and for some people years. So if you're not able to do it this week or next week, you know, Amber will still need somebody to chill with her in February. She'll need somebody to chill with her in March and April and May. So if you can't get by there right now, plan another day in a different month because this is an ongoing process. You know, grieving is a, is a long process for many people, especially when you lose somebody that's really close to you, like a mom. So we're talking about long-term actions you can take. So you may start out with cooking food or inviting her over for Netflix and chill. And in another month, you might just hang out or go for a walk on Kelly Drive or go sit down by um, the skating rink, you know, it's an ongoing process. So if you're not able to do it right now, please don't think that it's not necessary in a month or in three months or in six months or a year. It's still going to be necessary. And my last big thing, please don't try to cheer them up. Don't try to cheer people up when they're grieving. Grieving is a natural response to death and loss, and it is a process. We have to be patient with people who are grieving and not try to force them to feel better because we're not comfortable with them not feeling good, right? You're trying to cheer them up because you're not comfortable. You have to let people grieve at their own pace. When you try to cheer them up, Lord have mercy. You say some of the craziest stuff. Oh, you know, she's with the Lord. Oh, you know, it was her time. Nobody wants to hear that when they just lost a loved one. Nobody wants to hear that. And definitely nothing cheery. So please be patient with people when they're grieving. Allow them the space and time to grieve and get comfortable with knowing that it's okay. No cheering up people, please. No cheering them up. So if we are all on the same page, thank you for giving me this time. I hope that we're able to have some dialogue about it at some point. 
But I hope that this has helped you and blessed you. Uh, Amber, thanks for giving me this opportunity to serve in this way. God bless you all. Have a good night.